So I've been doing some research lately, and apparently talking about children's movies on YouTube can be incredibly profitable. And considering the dark, chaotic times we live in, I thought it might be a good idea to revert back to a simpler era, full of colourful characters, uplifting musical numbers, and happily ever afters. Unfortunately, I have a deep, dark secret, which is that I didn't actually grow up with any of these movies. Don't do it! No! Don't do it! I'm a virgin! The only actual Disney animated movies I've seen are The Lion King, The Old Jungle Book movie, The Wreck-It Ralph films, and Home on the Range for some reason. So, yep. The only movie I've seen from Disney's so-called renaissance in the 90s, which is what most of my generation grew up with, is The Lion King. And I only saw that one for the first time when I was like 16. So needless to say that I have absolutely no nostalgic attachment to any of these movies. Apparently people grew up with a whole array of heroes and heroines they could identify with and look up to, whereas the only animated character I truly relate to is this guy in Ralph Bakshi's Wizards who says, I say, miss, you better stop him. Stop him, miss! Stop him! I say, miss, you better stop him. So I've decided to spend an entire week finally catching up on all those 90s Disney movies that everyone around me growing up absolutely loved. They knew all the lyrics to all the songs and I would nod and pretend I knew what the hell they were talking about, but now my days of lying to the world are finally over. Today, I want to get to the bottom of what it is I truly missed out on. The princesses, the beasts, the musicals, and the ideological indoctrination? Question mark? I don't know, let's find out. Of course, the only logical place to start is with the movie that launched this Disney renaissance, and that is, of course, The Little Mermaid. And I'm gonna be honest here, I kind of like this one, but I think I like it because of some, let's say, thematic peculiarities, which I will get into. But first off, it's evident that Ariel really lays the groundwork for basically every female Disney protagonist from this point onward. The dichotomy of the known world and the unknown world, i.e. the world of the mermaids versus the surface world of humans, and Ariel's drive to emancipate herself from the patriarchal structure of her world is the kind of formula that we will see echoed throughout most of these films. Ursula works pretty well as a charismatic, although rather simplistic villain who takes advantage of people's naive longings and desires, and you'd think that she would serve as a good counterpoint to Ariel's idealization of the human world, and that Ursula's taking advantage of this idealization would, you know, lead to Ariel learning some kind of lesson with regards to this escapist mindset she has, but I'm not really sure that happens. And this is where things get interesting, in my view. Because of course, the film needs a happy ending. So the thematic concern of Ariel fantasizing about escaping to this idealized surface world is never really resolved. She doesn't really come to any kind of realization about reality. She has a low point in the film, but that's only because her man goes off with Ursula in disguise. And this is kind of the paradox of The Little Mermaid. The fact that Ariel idealizes this prince is her character flaw. It should be something she overcomes. I mean, she loses her voice for this guy, which obviously in a Disney musical is a negative. So you would expect there to come a point in the narrative where her delusion is shattered. But of course, Eric, the prince, needs to remain ideal for all the little girls watching the movie. So we can't have a scene where Ariel realizes Eric isn't as perfect as she thought, thus shattering her idealized delusion. This could have been the case if Eric wasn't under a spell and actually chose disguised Ursula of his own free will. That would have actually been an interesting moment. Ariel's idealized fantasy is confronted with the harsh reality, because her ideal man chooses a different woman because of his own idealized vision of that woman, as the one who sang that beautiful song to him on the beach. This would be a pretty cool thematic irony of sorts. But no, Eric is perfect, he was just under a spell. And when the voice returns to Ariel, he's like, oh, it was you all along, and they get together. So he doesn't really learn his lesson either. They both fall in love based on their fantastical views of each other. 
For Ariel, it's because he's a handsome representative of the outside world she so desperately wants to inhabit, and for Eric, it's because Ariel sang a pretty song to him one time, and so he became obsessed with finding her merely because of the romantic quality of that situation. A fascination with an aesthetic illusion. They're both tricked by their naive romantic view, but in the end, they never transcend that. This is made all the more confusing when we consider that scene where the prince explicitly states that he dislikes this statue they made for his birthday, which Ariel will later idealise and see as a beautiful representation of the prince. So it seems like the narrative is clearly setting up the fact that Ariel will have to come to some kind of realisation about her fantasy in the end. There's a disconnect between how she perceives the prince and how he perceives himself, or how he wants to be perceived. And the same goes for Eric's love for Ariel. He doesn't fall in love with her until she recovers her voice, even after spending all that time with her. It's a superficial, delusional love. And in the end, it's Triton, Ariel's father, who experiences the change in character. He learns to let go of his daughter, let her be free to explore the outside world. So the ultimate message is that young people should not abandon their naive, romanticised worldviews, it's the patriarchal structure that should change in order to accommodate their desires. Is that a weirdly progressive message, or does the movie kind of have to make that point because Disney is selling a romanticised view of the world? And needless to say that this isn't the same ending as the original Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. In that version, the prince is not obsessed with the mermaid song, he simply falls in love with the woman who saved him, but he wrongly believes that the person who saved him was the princess he first sees upon waking up on the beach, which frustrates Ariel and pushes her to go see the sea witch, who gives her the potion that will give her legs. And of course, one important aspect of the story that's left out of the Disney adaptation is the matter of soul. Ariel is told that while mermaids live longer than humans, when they die, they dissolve into sea foam, whereas humans possess an immortal soul which grants them eternal life in heaven. And it's important to note that this is what Ariel really desires. This informs her love for the prince. She wants an immortal soul, she's not just a hopeless romantic. And the sea witch tells her that if she can make the prince fall in love with her, part of his soul will pass into her, and therefore she will be able to go to heaven too. But things don't go according to plan, and unlike in the movie, Ariel does not end up with the prince. But she does escape her foamy fate. After failing to make the prince fall in love with her, her sisters bring her a magical dagger as a last resort, which she can use to kill the prince, and if she does that, she can just become a mermaid again. Because it's important to note as well that part of the Sea Witch's deal with Ariel is that if she takes the potion, turns into a human, and is unable to make the prince fall in love with her, and instead ends up marrying someone else later on, on her wedding night she will just turn into foam. And so she has to marry this specific prince. And also she has excruciating pains in her legs when she walks. That's just a side effect of the potion. So this is not a nice position she's in, so you can understand why she'd be desperate to go back to being a mermaid. However, she's unable to bring herself to kill the prince, and she throws herself into the ocean and dissolves. But just when we think it's all over, she becomes an earthbound spirit, a daughter of the air, who has been given the opportunity to one day rise up into heaven, but only if she spends the next 300 years doing good deeds. And the only reason she becomes a spirit is because she wanted with all her heart to obtain an immortal soul for her good Christian longing for a soul, I suppose. As you can see, it's not at all the same story. And some people criticised Anderson's version of the fairy tale for being too moralistic, simply an attempt to scare children into good behaviour, as P.L. Travers, the author of Mary Poppins, put it. But in response to these criticisms, Anderson said that, I have not allowed the mermaid's acquiring of an immortal soul to depend upon an alien creature, upon the love of a human being. I'm sure that's wrong. It would depend rather much on chance, wouldn't it? I won't accept that sort of thing in this world. I have permitted my mermaid to follow a more natural, more divine path. And all this is why I think that Disney's Little Mermaid is actually a kind of tragedy. 
and much less progressive than this fairy tale from 1837 in this sense, because in this version of the story, Ariel's fate does depend on the prince falling in love with her. In the end, neither of them awaken from their romanticized delusions. They just live happily ever after within it, I guess. And so neither do the kids watching this movie awaken from their romanticized trance. And that's my hot take on The Little Mermaid. Next, I watched Aladdin, which, to be honest, was pretty boring. I don't have that much to say about it. Obviously, this one is all about freedom, emancipation, specifically class emancipation for Aladdin, and emancipation from patriarchy in the case of Jasmine. Aladdin is poor, Jasmine is a woman, the genie is a slave to his master. They're all trapped, you get it. And Aladdin's first wish is to be made into a prince, because from his perspective, that's the only way he can marry Jasmine. His social and economic status is what's limiting him. And from Jasmine's perspective, she doesn't have the freedom to choose who she marries. It's her father who selects her suitors. She's still limited by the society she lives in, despite her position as the princess. And notice how, once again, it's the patriarchal figure who changes in the end, not our main characters. They are pure moral exemplars. I don't have that much to say about this film, it wasn't nearly as fun as I was hoping it would be, so instead, let me just recommend you go watch The Thief and the Cobbler instead. It's a very similar film that was in production hell for almost 30 years and is still incomplete. But even in its unfinished form, The Thief and the Cobbler displays so much more creativity than Aladdin, just some of the most imaginative and entertaining sequences ever put to animation. Just go watch it, it's incredible and it's on YouTube. But anyway, back to Disney. Next up was The Beauty and the Beast, which is a film about, surprise surprise, beauty and superficiality. Or at least, that's what the movie would like you to believe. But is it really? This is where Disney's desire to align all their female protagonists with a tried and true formula really does a disservice to the overall thematic arc of the film. Because Belle's arc isn't really about beauty or anything like that. Except, that's what the rest of the film seems to be about. Our first act sets up Belle as a character who wants to escape her mundane life. Her love of books fuels her romantic view of adventure. In short, she's a Disney protagonist, you get it. And so, obviously, when she has to give up her freedom to save her father, it's a big downer for Belle. But as we progress through the second act of the film, this aspect of Belle's character, which is to say, her defining feature, is seemingly forgotten, as she instead becomes a part of the Beast's narrative. And I know the whole Beauty and the Beast is actually about Stockholm Syndrome observation is kind of an overdone meme at this point, but it is kind of funny how, in order to cheer Belle up, the Beast treats her with a giant library. Because Belle loves books, right? Except, she used books as a means of escapism. So it's kind of like the movie is saying, Okay, Belle, hear me out. You're never actually going to leave this place. But look, at least you've got loads of books to read as a replacement for actually going on adventures, right? You happy now? In this sense, the ending that this story sets out for Belle should be perceived as incredibly underwhelming. I mean, sure, we can imagine that after this, the two of them travel the world together or something, but my point is that the one thing that's set up as being what Belle is all about is never really explored or resolved. She just gets caught up in someone else's story and ends up liking it enough for it to make her forget about her own desires. Belle's desire for adventure is only relevant when she's forced to give it up, exchanging her freedom for her father's. We understand this is a big blow for Belle because we understand from the opening scene that she values freedom and wants to escape this place. Belle later deciding to come back after the beast frees her implies that she now values her love for the beast more than her freedom, which obviously comes across, especially nowadays, as a somewhat problematic conclusion, right? Our intelligent and adventurous young heroine grows attached to the monster that was holding her captive. 
but it's okay because in the end he turns back into a handsome prince. So if you learn to love whatever person or system is oppressing you, you can actually turn it into a good thing that's not really aligned with what you were looking for in the first place, but it'll do, I guess. Now, if the movie introduced Belle's character and her goals in a slightly different light, these issues probably could have been rectified fairly easily. If Belle was set up in the beginning of the film as somewhat superficial, not necessarily mean, but longing for a handsome prince to accompany her on her adventures, then being confronted with the beast, as well as her loss of freedom, would be more meaningful and her growing love for the beast, despite him not fitting the description of the charming princes in her romance novels, would make more sense thematically. And then in the end, they both escape their prisons and go on adventures together. So now let's take a quick look at a movie that did the Beauty and the Beast much better than Disney, and that's Jean Cocteau's classic 1946 adaptation of the fairy tale. Here, the initial situation and overall tone is much different. Belle doesn't dream of escaping her mundane routine in search of adventure and freedom. This Belle doesn't want to leave her father. She's completely selfless and altruistic, and thus she's become a kind of prisoner of her own home and lets her sisters take advantage of her. The evil sisters are also here to serve as counterpoints to Belle's grace and beauty. They are vain, selfish, and superior, as well as being ungrateful and disrespectful to their father for losing money. All Belle asks from her father on his journey is a rose, and the sisters laugh at this, and later express that they believe she only requested such a modest gift as a slight against them. They simply cannot believe that Belle is just a nice person. And of course, the beast wanting to imprison Belle's father for stealing a rose, because it's the only thing he cherishes on this property, rather than imprisoning him for simply trespassing, is a much more poetic plot development, and gives the rose a more powerful symbolic status in the story, as it already draws a connection between Belle and the beast, and feeds into this thematic dichotomy we've already set up between modesty and luxury. Belle, who could have asked her father for anything, wants only a rose, and the beast, who lives in an opulent castle, cherishes only one thing, the rose. And of course, the great irony of Disney's adaptation comes with the fact that the film is built upon technical opulence. It's a grandiose, baroque picture all about the beauty within, apparently. A kind of contradictory presentation. But see how we already have way more thematic layers and angles from which to approach the later events of the story in this version, making it all add up to something much more meaningful in the end? And if your answer to that is that it's okay because Disney's version is just a kid's movie, that's fine, but the problem with the Disney-fied stitched up version of the story isn't that it's simply too childish or romantic or cutesy, it's that it's lacking all of those elements that build narrative significance and density. In the case of something like Beauty and the Beast, where your main character doesn't really have much internal conflict until the very end, this kind of thematic or symbolic nuance is really what carries the narrative. And in the end, most of Disney's adaptations of these stories end up feeling like empty shells, because this is the stuff that gets left by the wayside. And needless to say that the internal conflict that does exist within Belle's character is much more interesting in Cocteau's version, as before allowing Belle to go home to visit her father, the Beast gives Belle the key to his treasure and tells her that he will die soon. And so, this is a true test of Belle's supposed altruism and modesty. Everything up to this point in her story is about getting her to this situation, where her true character will be revealed. Will she decide to simply stay away until the beast dies and then return to claim his fortune, thus returning her family to their previous wealthy status, something even the beast expects her to do and has expressed he's basically fine with at this point? Or will she keep her promise and return to the beast? In Disney's version, it's more about her feelings, does she really love him, and will she remain true to her word despite her newfound freedom? That's all. This is because the economic aspect is less emphasised in the Disney version. It's more romantic, but less complex. Whereas in Cocteau's version, it's all about whether or not Belle will be corrupted by those around her. Those less pure than she is. And so, in summary, the issue isn't simply that Belle is a weak, two-dimensional character, after all, that's often the case in fairy tales. 
No, the issue is that there isn't enough going on around her in the Disney version to justify this kind of character, like there is in Cocteau's version. Okay, so this is around the point during my Disney week where I started to get really sick and tired of watching the 90s movies because, well, they're all really boring. Let's just say they're not exactly my cup of tea. So I decided to take a wee little break and watch some classic Disney movies instead, the ones that really launched the studio's popularity in the first place, starting with Snow White. There isn't really that much to say about this film. It's simply a truly impressive feat of animation. Every single scene is filled with so much vitality and creativity. That being said, given the fact that the imagery is certainly the main attraction here over, say, narrative complexity, I would have loved to see as much thematic density in the visuals as there was playfulness. Of course, it's perhaps unfair of me to expect too much from the first animated feature-length film ever made, beyond what it already accomplished, but you could also say that it's precisely this reluctance to tackle the complexity present in these fairy tales that led to an animation industry dominated by content aimed at children, rather than the more mature animation that someone like Ralph Bakshi strove for. There are plenty of reasons why people associate cartoons with children, and Disney's probably one of them. And that's not to say that Snow White is completely devoid of any quote-unquote intellectual content, as with most fairy tale adaptations, there's always something to talk about concerning the archetypal makeup of the thing, but there is always that feeling in Disney movies that it's all being toned down a bit, in aim of something more pleasant. It's as simple as that. It's cuter, it's more uplifting, more romantic, but in the process, the symbolic content of these stories gets dumbed down and truncated into whatever kind of image Disney is trying to fashion for itself at the time. In short, you could see Snow White and the Seven Dwarves as either a technical marvel that wrings as much playfulness as possible out of a classic fairy tale, enough to charm both kids and parents alike, or you could see it as the beginning of the end for Western animation, old Walt Disney gently condescending to an entire nation, sowing the seeds of the infantilization of many generations to come. I leave that up to you. I then decided to watch Cinderella. Slightly less impressive than Snow White, but still pretty solid. The main thematic thread here is one of dreams and the perseverance of hope through hard times. And of course, the realization of that dream comes in the form of the princess's proper reintegration into high society. Such a pretty girl doesn't belong in the role of a servant. She belongs with all the other pretty things, thus maintaining the beautiful royal line. I mean, I'm sure you guys understand that Cinderella is actually a story about eugenics, right? The glass slipper being the criterion for acceptable genetic makeup. After all, we wouldn't want the prince procreating with someone who has big, ugly feet and inferior genes, would we? <laughs> Damn, that started as a joke, but that actually seems like a pretty solid reading of the story. Well, if the shoe fits, as they say. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about Sleeping Beauty. Well, actually, I don't really have anything to say about the film itself, but I want to talk about the larger context of these fairy tale princess narratives and how we look back on them nowadays. The difference isn't really that in the old stories, the female characters were weak and without agency and always had to be saved by the prince in shining armor in the end, whereas now the princesses are strong and can take care of themselves, that's a fairly superficial reading, and one that these modern movies try to sell as a means of bolstering their own importance. The real difference is that these stories used to be archetypal, whereas now they've been passed through the Hollywood scriptwriting formula. In fact, it's the male characters who were the least developed in these movies. I mean, just look at the prince in Snow White. Who the hell even is this guy? What's his name? <laughs> the real point of these stories is that the princess's beauty, purity, and good-natured soul affects those she encounters such that they will be willing to save her later on. Whether it's a prince fighting a dragon in Sleeping Beauty, 
or the dwarves conserving and watching over Snow White's body when she supposedly dies instead of burning it, and then the prince offering First Love's true kiss to save her. The prince is the one with absolutely no agency in this story. He is subject to, and you could even say victim of, Snow White's beauty, and thus falls immediately in love with her. He has no choice. She's just that perfect. Okay, so stay with me here. You know how in Lord of the Rings, Frodo basically fails right at the end? He gives in to the ring's power of corruption, but it's precisely that giving in to the power of evil which leads to him fighting with Gollum, which then leads to the ring being destroyed, right? The point is that evil is self-defeating. The ring was created, it then got into the hands of people who were corrupted by its power, it then underwent an entire journey back to where it was created, and was destroyed because of its powers of corruption. The ring defeats itself. That's the, the cycle, the, that's why it's a ring, because it, it forms a, a ring, you know, you, you get what I'm saying? Evil is self-defeating, that's the point. And so these fairy tale stories are kind of like the opposite of the ring story. Replace the ring with a beautiful princess and Frodo with a gallant prince, and there you have it. Beauty and a pure soul will basically engender a series of events that lead to that beauty being saved from evil and corruption. Beauty saves itself. That's the point. And so yeah, of course the gender role aspect of these stories is dated, but what's really changed between the original versions of these stories and the more recent Disney fairy tales is not an updating of gender politics, it's an updating of our conception of storytelling, which in modern Hollywood is built around extremely tight and formulaic structures, mostly focused on character arcs, or at least the illusion of a character arc. So that's the real difference. Okay, whew, that was a very disorganized rant. Uh, okay, now let's get back to the 90s. We've had our fun, but we've got a job to do here, unfortunately. I'm not going to cover the rest in chronological order, because I want to get through the ones I don't have that much to say about quickly. So this is the lightning round, okay? Starting with Hercules. Okay, so the point here, obviously, is that what makes Hercules... A hero is that he had to prove his heroism. Hercules wants a place to belong. A he kind of hit myself as a this up, but it did annoy me about his identity. Uh, still suffers from the same, same kind of... I mean, mythologies are a loose and Trojan war thing. There is no strict canon, despite the fact that Hercules' story as stated in the intro song of the film takes place during the Golden Age of Greek mythology, and so way before Achilles or Cleopatra, obviously. Okay, I'm going to be real, guys. This is where things started getting real tough. Hercules was not a fun movie, and I may have, uh, you know, fast-forwarded through some of it, okay? Is that a crime? This is my video. What are you going to do about it? I said I was going to watch all of these movies, and I will do it, but I didn't say I would have interesting things to say about all of them, okay? Give me a break. Oh yeah, there's Rescuers Down Under. This one was pretty fun, actually, but... Absolutely nothing to say about it though. Ooh, what's this? Actual drama? Suspense? Comic relief sidekicks that are possibly just imaginary friends that characterize Quasimodo's loneliness rather than feeling like completely out of place tacked on characters that only serve to pad the runtime and offer nothing to the narrative? An interesting villain whose own internal conflict essentially serves as the thematic foundation of the entire movie, thus making him just as important as the main characters and not just some lazily constructed afterthought whose only motivation is be evil. And he also has my favorite song out of all of these movies? Could this be a Disney movie I actually like? Well, it's okay. Nothing to write home about, really. Moving on. When talking about Mulan, the main topic of interest seems to be the film's apparent attack on gender roles, and while that is an important aspect of the narrative, I'd argue that the film's central theme is actually honour. 
For example, the perceived problem with Milan's nonconformity in the beginning of the film is that it will bring dishonour to her family. And then of course there's Mushu the dragon who wants to restore his honour among the family ancestors by proving his worth after losing it years ago. And the love interest of the movie seeks to honour his father's legacy and live up to expectations. And in the end, once again, it's the authority figure that conforms to the protagonist, and a new system is created. The old world dies as our heroine proves the value of her nonconformity, and so the authority must accommodate her. She must be rewarded. But she is rewarded with symbols from the old world, the old system of honour. So it's a progressive story of updating the moral code and reconstructing it within the framework of that new progressive world. It's not that honour is a bullshit social construct, it's that the concept of honour needs to be updated to take into account new ways of being that would have been crushed in the old system. Okay, moving on to Pocahontas. Of course, like every female Disney character, Pocahontas is all about wanting to see what's around the riverbend, as she puts it. She wants to discover the outside world, and so this forms the basis of her romance with John Smith, as he represents something new, something different and exciting, just like Ariel's admiration for Prince Eric. The most enjoyable part of this movie is definitely John and Pocahontas' first meeting, because it's an almost purely visual sequence, where the characters must communicate via body language because of the language barrier. It has a serene and genuinely entertaining quality to it. However, this doesn't last long because Pocahontas soon magically acquires the ability to speak English. It's understandable why the writers thought this was necessary for the plot's development, but it just ends up destroying the only thing about this movie I actually liked, as it would have been much more interesting to develop this visual communication. But of course, this is the least of Pocahontas' problems. With this movie, there's always that elephant in the room, which is the problematic nature of the film's depiction of this romance between Pocahontas and John Smith, which almost certainly never actually happened, and it doesn't take much research to find out why the propagation of this legend is highly offensive, not only to Native American populations, but to history itself, really. So what I'm going to do is simply recommend that you watch Terence Malick's The New World instead. Now, both films are certainly inaccurate and quasi-propagandistic accounts of Pocahontas' story, but at least The New World does a better job of portraying the gruesome reality of the collision between these two worlds. And needless to say that Malick's exploration of the theme of man's relation to nature is much more expansive and interesting than Disney's, as it's a a recurring investigation that we see throughout his entire filmography. In Disney's version, the tree lady tells Pocahontas to listen to nature, which is how she communicates with Smith for the first time. So in this film, it's like nature is representative of peace and the human heart and this underlying universal interconnectedness of all things. If you follow the way of nature, everything will be all right. It's the gentle guiding hand of fate, and we should live our lives in accordance with its will. It's a rather simplistic, ecological message. However, Terence Malick's The New World offers a kind of dialectical relationship between mankind and nature. John Smith becomes enamoured with the untouched natural state of these people, encapsulated in Pocahontas. But it's his presence, the presence of his people in this place, that disrupts that natural state, leading to the destruction of its beauty, and also leading to Pocahontas being married off to another man. The two states cannot coexist. Civilization's interaction with nature is the very thing that corrupts it, and so Malik simply employs the story of Pocahontas as a template for his signature exploration of man's rapport with nature, which we can also see in Days of Heaven and The Thin Red Line. Okay, now let's talk about Tarzan, because these two films actually address similar issues, and to be completely honest, I think that Tarzan basically did Pocahontas better. And you might think that comparing Tarzan the Monkey Man to the indigenous peoples of America is a tad offensive, but my point is simply that both films deal with man versus nature. 
the civilized versus the supposedly uncivilized, and how the two clash when they come together. Any story like this is going to have the classic narrative conceit of nature versus civilization, with a romance in the middle where the guy or girl gradually becomes assimilated into the quote unquote uncivilized community. It's Pocahontas, it's Dances with Wolves, it's Avatar, they're all the same. But Tarzan also has the thematic question of integration and belonging and the meaning of family, because Tarzan himself isn't a gorilla. He's not one of them, so he himself is representative of a kind of split identity. It's not just about two separate worlds coming together, it's about a man who is a member of both worlds and must choose where he belongs. And it's through his romance with Jane that this inner conflict is explored. And we have a very similar scene in this movie to the one in Pocahontas where John Smith and Pocahontas meet for the first time. But the reason why I prefer Tarzan is because the exploration of communication is continued throughout the entire film. In the beginning, for example, Tarzan simply imitates Jane's English, making for a much more interesting gimmick. And the animation of Tarzan's movement and body language is honestly awesome. And to be honest, Tarzan is also what I wrongly expected more Disney movies to be. Fun. The action sequences in this movie are genuinely exciting and extremely entertaining. Okay, now that we've covered all of the Disney Renaissance movies that I had never seen before, I want to quickly jump ahead so that I can talk about a Disney movie that continues this exploration of nature and man's role within nature, and that film is Moana. Moana is an interesting case, narratively speaking, because our main character basically has her own personal deus ex machina in the form of the ocean itself. Because she's been chosen, she's special, and so the ocean just kind of helps her out from time to time. I guess this kind of feeds into a theme already present in Pocahontas, right? The idea of going with the flow of nature, listening to its will. Except that in Moana, it's actively used as a narrative device, not just a kind of message being imparted to an audience. There are multiple moments where the story could only have advanced through the intervention of the ocean as a helping hand in Moana's journey. And the main issue with this is that it kind of deflates the tension and also makes us feel like Moana has a huge advantage over everyone else in the film. I mean, the ocean itself is on her side. And sure, the ocean doesn't always help her, but to be honest, that only makes it more frustrating. And even when it doesn't explicitly come to her aid, in the end, it's all part of the plan. I mean, the ocean knows what it's doing. So at the end of the day, even when it doesn't respond to her call for help, it is helping her because it knows that whatever's about to happen needs to happen to get Moana to where she needs to be. Now, if the point the film is trying to make is that all human action is fundamentally pointless, or at the very least subordinate to the whims of nature, thus undermining the classical Hollywood narrative seeing as none of the main character's choices really matter unless they are supported by the will of the ocean, then I guess it succeeded. But that's not what the film is going for, because that kind of quietism would contradict the film's progressive call to action. Because you see, in the opening act, the film sets up a conflict between conservative and progressive points of view on a political dilemma. The island is dying, but the dad is afraid of leaving in search of a new island because of his past experiences and the dangers of the ocean. But Moana understands that they need to go beyond the reef in order to save their people. And of course, this need also happens to align with her lifelong desire to go beyond the reef. See, Disney always has to plant that escapist seed in there somewhere. Because remember, that's what they're selling here. Narratively speaking, it probably would have been more interesting if Moana was a character who didn't want to go on this journey, but had to in order to save her people. You know, a bit of internal conflict never hurts. But no, instead, Moana dreams of going on an adventure, and she just so happens to need to in order to save her tribe. But if everything is determined by nature, then you can see how this message doesn't really add up. Do we humans really have a choice here? I mean, Moana's entire life was defined by the ocean's will to make her into this special chosen person who would save nature. But of course, the whole point here is really that humans need to be the ones to repair the damage they've caused to nature. Maui was the one who stole the heart, and he did it to please humans. So it's humanity's fault, right? And so the ocean, nature, expects humans to be the ones to rectify this. 
And I guess the point of the ocean's interventions in Moana's journey is to say that if we're good people and we try to help nature, then nature will help us help it, which seems like a very simplistic and anthropocentric kind of view of things. Okay, now let's rewind and take a quick look at what happened in the years immediately following the Disney Renaissance, and how Disney reclaimed their former glory in the 2010s. So, following Tarzan, which is seen as the last of the Disney Renaissance movies, we get Fantasia 2000, which is basically a flop, and then Dinosaur, which actually does pretty well worldwide. However, Disney then has a string of films that struggle to break even. The Emperor's New Groove and Atlantis, and then there's Treasure Planet and Home on the Range, which are just straight up flops for the studio. However, in this period we do have a few minor successes like Lilo and Stitch, Brother Bear, Chicken Little, and Bolt, but it's all very uneven. But this is where we enter Disney's second renaissance, if you will. While The Princess and the Frog didn't really do that well, it certainly wasn't a flop, and I think it's important as it marks Disney's return to our classic fairy tale princess stories. But in the same way the 90s princess movies were more, let's say, culturally conscious, seemingly giving their female characters more agency, more definition than the earlier Disney fairy tale adaptations, these late period Disney princess movies exist in a world where those 90s movies already happened. And so Disney needs to keep piling on the self-awareness, which results in something like Tangled where the evil witch's ultimate power is being really passive-aggressive. This movie certainly leans way more into parody than was usual for Disney, and in fact ends up feeling closer in spirit to a DreamWorks movie. And there's also The Princess and the Frog, which aims at a kind of subversion of one of the most widely recognised fairy tale tropes, while at the same time attempting to justify reintroducing that classic Disney magic back into our lives, telling us that dreams and hard work is good and all, but your life will never really be complete and fulfilling unless you find true love, preferably in a wealthy prince. However, it's with Frozen that Disney finally manages to merge this newfound self-awareness about Disney princess cliches with that classic grandiosity. Basically, they found a way to have their cake and eat it too. They can just replicate the Disney princess formula from the 90s, but now it's in CGI and Prince Charming is actually evil. Wow. What a subversion. And then there's films like Wreck-It Ralph, Zootopia, Big Hero 6, which are all incredibly successful. So unlike in the 2000s when Disney's attempts to cover a wide variety of stories, ranging from a movie about cows to an adaptation of a classic adventure story set in space, weren't so successful, it seems like they've now found a way to diversify without losing their audience. So in summary, what have we learned today? We've learned that Disney's relationship with classic fairy tales has evolved quite a bit over the years, going from rather narratively simplistic but visually opulent adaptations to modern attempts at blending progressive messaging into romantic escapist narratives, merging the two so as to justify Disney's existence as a positive political entity in the modern pop culture landscape and to assure its continued success. And I'd like to make a larger point about the general infantilization of an entire generation, but am I intellectually equipped to make that kind of grand sweeping observation? Probably not. So I will abstain from doing so. However, I will end this video by saying that if you are going to regress back to childhood and spend your time watching cartoons, not only are there better animated movies out there, there are better adaptations of these same fairy tales. So just watch something that isn't the homogenized Disney slurm that gets poured into your trough every two years. Diversify, goddammit. There's loads of great stories out there. Lots of great animation. Okay, that's it. I'm done. Uh, consider, you know, do the Patreon thing or follow me on Twitter. Uh, you know, do what you gotta do. Just definitely don't spend a week watching Disney movies. You'll regret it. Okay, see ya.